Okay. So it's my pleasure to briefly introduce our two speakers. Uh, we're, we have an interesting format tonight. They are going to alternate uh, asking each other questions. And um, Alahi Amani is going to focus more on the international side of CEDAW. And Rosemary Straley is going to focus more on the US and San Diego initiatives going on. So um, you can read this here for Alahi Amani. These are just the highlights. Of course, there's much more to her background. So she served in broad ranging roles as administrator and lecturer with California State University System for 31 years. She received many awards and international recognition for her contributions to the efforts of civil society organizations, especially in areas promoting cross-cultural understanding. And she's a highly respected advocate for human rights and women's rights. And she leads delegations to the UN in this regard. And for Rosemary, oops. Sorry, good. There you go. She's played a catalytic role in the advancement of women in the US globally and, uh, sorry, in the US and globally. After 15 years in Washington, DC, she was selected as sole American in Paris at UNESCO's International Institute for Educational Planning. She served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana and also as a Peace Corps director in Cameroon. And her career in international development took her to 158 countries. So with that, I am turning it over to Rosemary and Alahi. So Rosemary, unmute, please. Before we get started, Christine, I just want to thank you so much for presenting this program on CEDAW and for inviting Alahi and me uh, this is such an honor for me to be on the same stage with Alahe Amani. Uh, she has made and continues to make so many contributions to this country, especially as you mentioned in the dimension of cross-cultural understanding. So uh, as Christine mentioned, we're going to have a kind of conversation this evening instead of um, an er erudite presentation. Um, let's see, why is it important for World Affairs Council to have this program? And why does CEDAW matter to us in San Diego? Well, I think it's important for the World Affairs Council to be having this program because your members are some of the most informed people about global affairs. And as such, they need to be cognizant of the important role that this human rights instrument, CEDAW, plays in the world. CEDAW matters now to us here in San Diego because finally it's arriving in our own community 43 years after it was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly. And Jimmy Carter was president then, and he signed for the US. CEDAW will provide a legal framework within which we can tackle the barriers that keep San Diego women and girls from attaining their highest potential. So I'm going to ask Elahe some questions, um, starting out Really, <clears throat> I think we need to put CEDAW in context. So Alahe, tell us about the human rights instruments which have been implemented since the inception of the UN 75 years ago when it first adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is uh, just an extraordinary document for that time and it was conceived and crafted by our own Eleanor Roosevelt. So what, what about this matter of, of conventions? Thank you very much. Greeting to everyone from Long Beach, California. Eleanor Roosevelt had a leading role 
as chairperson of the drafting committee of Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as we know. Three years of Eleanor Roosevelt hard work and consensus building produced a document that had shaped the way the states, uh, nations treated their citizen from the time um, forwarded and hold, hold them responsible if they fail to adhere to those ideals. She is one of the women who inspired many generations of women activists. So to respond specifically to this question, there are nine core international human rights instruments. Each of the instruments has also a committee of experts to monitor implementation of the treaty provisions by state parties signed, who signed and ratified that. Some of the treaties are supplemented by optional protocol dealing with specific concerns. So to keep them up to date with the current affair of the world. So uh, these, uh, these conventions, human rights conventions are an uh, international convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination, international covenant on civil and political rights, international covenant on economic and social and cultural rights, Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or SIDA. Convention Against Torture and All Cruel, Inhuman and Degrading Treatment. Convention on the Rights of the Child. International Convention of Protection of the Rights of All Migrants uh, Families. And lastly, um, International Convention for for the for the persons with disability. So um, I think I missed one of them, an international convention for protection of all persons from forced, um, uh, oops, my screen just, uh, uh, for forced person. So, uh, so th these are the human rights convention. And as I said, these are, the convention that was passed by UN General Assembly after international human rights conversion that Eleanor Roosevelt contributed to. Wow. So all these years then, um, the original declaration has been elaborated to take care of all these different kinds of, of human rights. Uh, well, now let's talk specifically about the one that is our subject tonight. CEDAW. What is CEDAW? The Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, was adopted in 1979 by the UN General Assembly. It is a landmark international agreement that affirms principle of fundamental human rights and equality for women and girls around the world. It is the most comprehensive international agreement on eliminating discrimination against women and address the economic, political, and social rights of women and girls. CEDA calls for equal education, equal employment, and training opportunities while promoting non-discrimination and availability of social benefits, including social security, healthcare, maternity leaves, childcare, etc. Finally, it addressed the critical areas of concern, including gender-based violence, sex trafficking, and domestic violence or domestic abuse. Since every country is different, CEDA provides a blueprint for the government to overcome the remaining barriers to discrimination. It defines what constitutes discrimination against women, which is very important, and set up an agenda of national action to end such discrimination. The treaty provides for monitoring and oversight by a CEDA committee, which is under Human Rights um, Institution of United 
nation composed of indifferent, uh, independent experts in gender equality elected by countries that have ratified CEDAW. Uh, the, the treaty also often called Bill of Rights of Women uh, and provides international standard for protecting and promoting human rights. Uh, and it's the only international instrument that comprehensively addresses these rights, affirming that women have equal human rights and fundamental freedom in the political, economic, social, cultural, and civil fields. Well, um, so this really then sets out the standards for all the countries of the world. Uh, here in, in the US, we're, um, we're used to a one-line law, uh, the Title IX, we're celebrating Title IX, um, the 50th anniversary this year. That's just about education. So it sounds like um, CEDAW just covers the waterfront then. It, it's every conceivable aspect of women's lives. It's absolutely, absolutely. Uh, excellent question, Rosemary. Um, the, I believe CEDAW and Title IX has the same spirit. Title IX turns, as you said, 50 this, this summer. Uh, well, and it's uh, 50 years ago that uh, we passed Title IX, not knowing that within the last 15, 20 years, it, it came from margin to the center of agen agenda in higher education. And I was, uh, I was for, uh, instrumental in shaping the Title IX at Cal State Fullerton. I was deputy director of Title IX. So very important, Excellent. same spirit. Um, and as we know, Title IX bars federally funded educational program and activities from discriminating on the basis of sex. The core of CEDA, which is called also, as I shared, Bill of Rights for Women and Girls, it shares the same spirit. Title IX's uh, revolutionary policy shaped gender equity in education and sport, and CEDA will ensure the rights of women and girls are respected and protected. Uh, right. and well, what, <clears throat> what's really the um, history, what, what led up to the adoption of CEDAW? Very interesting story. I just want to mention before responding to um, to that uh, question that also CEDA has uh, it's a it's a document with thirty articles. Uh, part one of the CEDA articles, Article One to Six, defines discrimination and set out the obligation of a general nature. So focusing on discrimination. Part two guarantees the of equality of political and public life. Uh, part three, which is article 10 to 14, guarantees of equality in social and economic uh, rights of women. And, uh, and the part four is uh, article 15 and 16, guarantee of equality before law and marriage and family life. And last part, established CEDA committee and a state monitoring mechanism um, uh, and, um, and formal procedures matter. So it really focused on anti-discrimination and protecting the rights of women and girls. Uh, you ask about uh, what does CEDA do? Uh, the treaty, in my opinion, provides an international standard for protecting and promoting uh, a woman's human rights and is the only international um, instrument that comprehensively addressing this right, affirming that women have equal human rights and fundamental freedom in political, economic, social, cultural, and civil rights. Um, and well, it, it, it's been, um so difficult in, in this country to get women written into our governing laws. Um, and we still don't have our 
Equal Rights Amendment. So it must be quite a story. How did the world, which has so many different points of view about women uh, based on cultural, uh, the different um, practices in different countries, how did this come to be? How was it accomplished? What led up to this enactment? Very interesting story, and thank you for asking this question because um, um, uh, the stories are so interesting in how these um, global efforts shaping to uh, to protect women's human rights. Um, we all know that in 1960s we saw an emergence in many parts of the world, including United States and other countries, of a new consciousness of the patterns of discrimination against women and a rise in the number of organizations globally committed to combating the effect of such discriminations. Uh, the, ad, uh, the adverse effect of some development policies, um, you, you know, we know that there were some um, outcomes of development policies that affected women. Uh, so uh, the adverse impact of some development policies on women also became apparent. In 1972, the UN Commission on Status of Women considered the possibility of preparing a binding treaty that would give normative force to the provisions of the declaration and decided to request the Secretary General to call upon United Nations member states to transmit their views on such proposal. The following year, a working group was appointed to consider the elaboration of such convention. In 1974, at its 25th session of UN Commission on the Status of Women, uh, and in the light of the report of the working group, uh, the commission decided, uh, the UN Commission, um, commission on the Status of Women uh, decided in principle to prepare a single comprehensive and internationally binding instrument to eliminate discrimination against women. So this was the really the notion behind, uh, behind CEDA, eliminate discrimination against women. This instrument was to be prepared uh, without prejudice of any future recommendation that might be made by the United Nations or its specialized agency with respect to the preparation of legal instruments to eliminate discrimination in specific fields. So during uh, drafting work, uh, the committee prepared the drafting work within the commission was encouraged by the world plan of action for implementation of objective of international women's year. Many of us would remember that 1975 uh, was the year of women, first time that United Nations called the year of women. And the first international women conference was, um, was organized in Mexico City in 1975, which called for a convention on the elimination of discrimination against women with effective procedure for its implementation. And work was also encouraged by General Assembly which had urged the Commission on the Status of Women to finish its work by 1976, so that the convention would be complemented in time of 1980, the second international uh, UN conference in Copenhagen. Uh, so the Convention of Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination, CEDA was adopted by the General Assembly in 1979 by vote of 130 states. Uh, and in the resolution 3480, in which the General Assembly adopted the convention, the Assembly, the General Assembly expressed the hope that the convention would come into force 
at, a, at an early date and requested the uh, Secretary General to present the text of the convention to the mid-decade conference uh, of the United Nations Decade of Women, which was 1975 to 1985. And the Copenhagen was, I, I, was the mid-decade conference. I have to mention that uh, rest in peace, Billy Hiller, an American activist, uh, which I had the pleasure of knowing her and um, was an early advocate for women's rights, attended this 1980 conference in Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, of course, United States was very active. United States delegation was very active in shaping the text of CEDA. Same way that Eleanor Roosevelt was, uh, was instrumental in um, the Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, so UN, uh, United States women were active in drafting the language of CEDA and Billy was the founding member and chair of the National Committee on the United Nations uh, Convention on Elimination of um, uh, uh, All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So, so Billy was the founding member of CEDA committee and a member of the steering committee for national Woman Political Caucus. Amazing woman. I had the pleasure of knowing her and I used to go to her home in Beverly Hills um, in LA and we were, uh, we were putting together a newsletter on CEDA during those years, during early 1980s and um, mailing it to women organization in United States. Mm. Well, we haven't heard about CEDAW that much in this country until recent years, but in other nations during the 43 years it's been in effect, it certainly has um, been being implemented. Can you give us some examples of what difference it makes to have CEDAW in these countries, to have this the uh, rule of law? Sure, uh, you know, uh, as you mentioned, CEDA globally uh, was uh, brought lots of, um, we can highlight some of the achievements of CEDA globally. Um, it, uh, it has led to tremendous uh, changes around the world um, in, uh, and uh, Turkey, for example, I just shared some of the, some of the highlights. Um, Turkey changed laws to raise marriageable age to 17, allowing women to keep their own maiden name, work outside the home, and keep their own wages without permission of their husband. This was in result of a CEDA ratification of Turkey. Honduras created policies to make agricultural training and loans available to women farmers. Uh, Austria amended policies for maternity protection and paternity leave. Cambodia created a women's ministry based on ratification of CEDA. Canada created an institute to address health disparities between women and men. Uganda created and funded programs to reduce domestic violence. Israel allocated funding for all women for mammogram. Argentina developed a program to prevent teen pregnancy and care for teen mothers, especially homeless teen mothers. And I can continue that all these uh, countries that ratified CEDA really, uh, we can highlight what in this country have accomplished for, uh, for elimination of discrimination against women and protecting the women's right. I wanna mention, citizenships in Japan was also in result of CEDA, inheritance rights, and many, many other, uh, other advantage that CEDA brought, um, implementation of CEDA mm -hmm. brought to these countries. So coming to the US then, and thinking about CEDA in the US, uh, how did this really get started here? Tell us about uh, what the Women's Intercultural Network has been doing and uh, the, what happened in San Francisco, how San Francisco became the model. 
Right, Sam. Uh, well, um, as U.S. Um, hasn't, uh, President Carter signed CEDA, uh, but it hasn't been ratified. Um, uh, I have to mention other conventions uh, ratified during both um, uh, the presidency of both Republican and Democratic presidents, but CEDA hasn't been ratified uh, by U.S. Uh, and, but women in U.S., I believe, uh, greatly benefit from under CEDA uh, implementation, uh, whether nationally or at uh, locally at, um, at cities and counties um, in our states or other states. Um, and so it, it definitely uh, benefits women in the United States in many respects. Uh, but to respond to your question, um, uh, we, we know that, uh, you know, at the Commission on the Status of Women, uh, Women's Intercultural Network, along with San Francisco Commission on the Status of Women, um, they felt that we need to, uh, we need to bring, it, uh, bring the global local and bring CEDAW locally to our uh, our community. So uh, Women's Intercultural Network embarked on a campaign of cities for CEDA, which actually conceptually it's cities and counties for CEDA. And um, so we, it's a campaign nationally. And um, so um, we were the civil, um, civil society partner of um, Commission on the Status of Women in San Francisco. And uh, this campaign has created wave in the United States uh, after San Francisco, um, uh, which I encourage everyone to, to take a look at uh, two, two websites, Cities for CEDA website, which is a website being administered by Women's Intercultural Network and also the San Francisco Commission on the Status of Women. And, um, and you can see the highlights of what San Francisco have achieved because of the implementation of CEDA. But in any ways, this campaign is moving forward. Um, the, and Los Angeles was the second city after San Francisco that implemented CEDA. Well, this has uh, given us a good sense of what's happened in the world and uh, and then in the United States, cities for CEDAW being active. Um, should we bring it locally then? Absolutely, absolutely. As, as, I, um, as I shared, um, cities for CEDAW, um, it's a campaign specifically to adopt local <clears throat> whether cities or counties, local measures uh, reflecting CEDA and human rights principle as a way to address barriers to full equality of women and girls. And um, such measures uh, generally in all cities that implemented CEDA. The last one in California, I believe, is city of Irvine that, um, that uh, issued an ordinance for CEDAW. But generally speaking, uh, uh, it requires a gender analysis of the city operations, uh, an oversight body to monitor the implementation uh, of a local CEDAW ordinance, um, for example, and it could be in, in any forms and shapes, and funding to support the implementation of CEDAW principle. And as I shared in San Francisco in 1998, um, became um, CEDA was implemented by an ordinance and became the first city in the United States to adopt an ordinance reflecting CEDA strengthened, you know, principles. And um, and I have to say that both um, mentioned that under the leadership of President Reagan, Bush, and Clinton. The US ratified similar uh, treaties on genocide, torture, and race. Uh, so ratification requires two thirds of Sena to stand together for women's equality and has no additional financial cost. Um, so January 2018, principle of CEDAW, 
to improve the lives of, of women and girls. And since adaptation, uh, San Francisco has developed new initiative on domestic violence, homicide, human trafficking, family-friendly workplace, and expanded language access for responders to domestic violence, which was amazing. And LA adopted the same thing. You just, you just took some of what I was gonna talk about. I was gonna talk about California. And uh, are you asking me about San Diego? Why it's taken us so long to- Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so why is taking San Diego, Rosemary? <laughs> you've been, I know that uh, we've been connected We've been connected through Women's Intercultural Network for a long time. So why has it taken San Diego so long to get <laughs> on board with CEDA? Critical question. Well, uh, there was an effort here years ago, 24 years ago, actually, when Anne Hoiberg, and I think Anne is with us this evening, she was the president of the League of Women Voters at the time that she uh, led the delegation to the Beijing conference, which um, Elias mentioned. So at that point, the city council unanimously passed a CEDAW resolution, 1998. And that was under the sponsorship of our illustrious elected Christine Kehoe, who uh, many of us probably know. Um, well, if you've ever tried to get an ordinance passed, then you know that a resolution is a whole lot easier. So why then has it taken all these years? Well, um, the political climate has a lot to do with how rapidly things can happen. And in San Diego, it has taken years, election by election, Finally, we've gotten to the point where we have progressive leadership in the majority. So now at last, both the mayor and the chair of the board of supervisors have the vision and the energy to move forward in addressing critical issues like women's rights. So that's your answer. Right. So the second question, I think it's, um, uh, we all want to know that during these years uh, that you were busy or Anne was busy, which I had the pleasure of knowing Anne too, um, uh, during these years, what have you been learning about CEDA activity in the rest of California? What has well, San Francisco did in 1998? Yeah, as usual, California has been leading the way. Um, and are we the first state where the state legislature has adopted a CEDAW resolution. So we're a model for the country about that as well. Uh, in the latest reporting, California has 10 cities or counties with CEDAW resolutions, six cities or counties with CEDAW ordinances. Uh, that's seven if we jump the gun and count uh, San Diego County. And there are 10 cities or counties somewhere in the process of a resolution or ordinance. So how about, uh, how about Los Angeles? Um, they, Los Angeles adopted um, CEDA ordinance in 2003. Uh, yes, and it got off to a slow start actually, but when Mayor Garcetti came on the scene, it really took off. The uh, city partnered with the university and they produced a stellar report on the status of women and girls in LA. It was the first of its kind, a comprehensive study detailing the data on specific manifestations of gender equality in LA. And on that very day, the report came out, the mayor issued an executive order on gender equity and he called on every city department to help LA fulfill its responsibilities under the CEDAW ordinance. So LA has served as a model for its implementation. Uh, it's created a gender equity coalition, which includes a gender equity 
liaison from every single city department. Mayor Garcetti directed the leadership of each department to prepare a gender equity action plan complete with quarterly progress reports. So that's how they've been measuring and addressing the disparities in the workplace. So LA has put in place um, a wide variety of quite imaginative programs, youth development, public safety, women's leadership. And I should mention that because we could do the same thing here. That really was low hanging fruit. For the first time in LA history, the city achieved gender parity on its 41 boards and commissions. And now women hold more than 50% of those positions and there no longer is any all male commission. So the mayor closed the wage gap, women hold leadership positions in non-traditional fields. And you could, we could just go on and on about all the good stuff that's happening in Los Angeles. So we have lots to learn from those who are, are already doing this. So now that we heard from you from San Francisco and LA, can Rosemary, please, can you tell us the process developed in San Diego to push for a CEDA ordinance? Timing always is important. The League of Women Voters in 2019 mobilized four dozen community organizations to plan for the commemoration in 2020 of the 100th anniversary of the adoption of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which granted women, many women, not all women, the right to vote. The League, in consultation with these organizations, decided that in addition to celebrating an appropriate project would be to address unfinished business, such as the adoption of a CEDAW ordinance, which would provide a comprehensive legal framework for advancing women's rights in San Diego. So the Centennial Coalition formed a CEDAW working group. We studied ordinances which had been adopted by cities around the US and uh, the draft ordinance we've crafted for San Diego did draw heavily upon the ordinances of San Francisco and Los Angeles. So what has been in um, the role of city council? Early in our process, we sought out guidance from members and staff of the city council and Anne uh, was in on an early meeting, we uh, asked President Pro Tem Barbara Bree to be the major sponsor of the CEDAW ordinance. Barbara, as uh, many of you may know, has been a real leader in San Diego for uh, women's issues and organizations. So we worked with her to shepherd the package through the arduous legislative process. Our goal had been city council adoption by Women's Equality Day in August, 2020. But COVID intervened and slowed the process. We had to settle for a unanimous vote for a proclamation recognizing the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and committing to an act of CEDAW ordinance. Then we lost our sponsor who chose not to run for another term on the city council. So, uh, so because of COVID interrupted your efforts, uh, so you decided, um, the woman in San Diego decided that timely action about CEDA was more likely with the county? Yes, um, in October, 2020, the chair of the Board of Supervisors, Nathan Fletcher, promised to enact a CEDAW ordinance when he got two more votes. And the next month, November, two progressive supervisors were elected, Nora Vargas and Tara Lawson-Reamer. Since the county has a commission on the status of women and girls, that body worked with the Office of County Council and the Office of Equity and Racial Justice 
to draft the CEDAW ordinance. Last month, public forums were held to obtain public comment. And we're told that the county is now in the process of reviewing and incorporating that feedback they've received from uh, various organizations and people. So what are the uh, what are the main provisions of the county's draft CEDA ordinance? Well, the heart of the ordinance is, as you mentioned before, is um, and this part of the CEDA ordinance is everywhere, is um, first the analysis of data from a gender perspective to lay out the facts about policies, programs, staffing, allocation of resources, representation on boards and commissions, all of that. Then to determine the causes for the disparities and to develop and implement action plans designed to address the inequities documented in the gender analysis in order to achieve gender parity. So, um, that's the uh, that is laid out in in the county ordinance, and then each county and city ordinance specifies particular programmatic areas to be addressed. San Diego County has selected six on which to focus: economic development, the criminal legal system, voting rights, and civil engagement healthcare, gender-based violence and harassment, housing and homelessness. There may be somebody from the county on this Zoom uh, and uh, we could ask them to answer any questions that might come up about the draft ordinance during the Q&A. Excellent, excellent. Um, so love achievements in San Diego. And so in, uh, what are the next steps uh, with the city of San Diego? Well, uh, first to, to get the county ordinance, it was docketed for, uh, for um, April 26, but is being delayed because we really do want uh, some changes incorporated. And we could go into that during a Q and A, what the League of Women Voters um, has submitted some uh, pretty solid recommendations for changes. But as far as the city is concerned, last month during Women's History Month, it's always a good idea to connect CEDAW with something happening. Uh, Mayor Todd Gloria announced at a press conference that the city would establish a commission on the status of women and girls and will adopt and implement a CEDAW ordinance. And it looks like perhaps city council member Marnie Von Wilpert of District 5 may be the one taking the lead about the CEDAW ordinance. So now with strong backing from the mayor, we have hope that the women's rights framework finally will be ensconced in law to assure that equity for girls and women can be pursued in San Diego, the, in the city, as well as in the county. Thank you very much. I think that's wonderful news for all of us in California. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't have any other questions and I guess we are open for Q&A. Pass it on the mic to Christine. Hey, thank you. That was there was a lot of information in there, and I'm probably going to ask you to follow up, maybe, and provide a summary of of some of that because it's really important, especially the part that impacts uh, San Diego. Um, one question related to the last part of your discussion: what What are the major differences between the draft ordinance for San Diego and Los Angeles and San Francisco? Now, what I understood was. I assume in all three cases, you've, you've gathered data because you were emphasizing data so that there's data. So is that the driving force that has caused differences that the demographics and other factors um, that are different between or among San Francisco, Los Angeles and San Diego? 
is that what's caused the differences and, and what are the differences? Alahe, you've been working with a professor at uh, UC Irvine who was very instrumental in the Los Angeles um, ordinance. Well, I want to, I want to, I see the name of Gail James here. She's attending and um, she is really uh, so knowledgeable about all these drafts. Uh, hi, Gail. Uh, she's uh, the chair of the uh, Cities for CEDA for Women's Intercultural Network. And I'm really glad, I appreciate that she's attending from Kansas City, joining us. Uh, and so, Gail, uh, uh, I would invite your comment on that because you're more involved on the San Diego versus LA and San Francisco. I'll just say briefly, uh, very briefly, that um, we we take a look, we, we collect all of the ordinances that we have from Philadelphia, P Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, uh, et cetera. And, um, and we, they're built on the, the standard template that um, San Francisco uh, initiated really and set the template that had legal scholars looking at it and policy experts uh, looking at it. And it incorporates um, basic tenets so that they're, it's legal so that human rights incorporated into public policy have a very uh, clear legal framework. But that said, every city designs it in a different way because their uh, city officials, their legal staff, take a look at it and they shape it in the way that they choose to for their city. If they want to emphasize um, workplace equity, for example, or gender-based violence, um, uh, racial equity, other intersectional uh, matters are coming now into new ordinances that weren't in the original ones. And so each city has its own shape to it. We do have a template that we offer uh, and that people model their uh, resolutions and ordinances from. But so, as I say, they're, they're quite different one from another. For the specific examples of San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego, I can't call one to mind at the moment, but I, th I think that we can, um, we can send you that information very easily. But our, our, uh, the, the abiding conclusion really is that each city designs their ordinance according to their environment and their right. climate. I would, I would be interested specifically yeah. in the San yes. Diego information and the data that goes with yes. it. We might be able to push that out through the San Diego World Affairs Council. Yes. And um, another question is, and perhaps you answered it, and if so, you know, just say so, but how does this intersect with war zones and conflict zones, with women being the targets, whether it's um, rape, as we're hearing now in Ukraine, so both the violent part of a war and also when the wars end and the rehabilitation, how does CEDA mm -hmm. impact that? And who I, oversees who oversees what the priorities are, what the needs are, and, and who does it? I can respond to it to this question because um, I and I want to bring up the case of Afghanistan. Exactly. Uh, we know that Afghanistan was um, the CEDA was approved, and actually right after the time that uh, the previous um, uh, Taliban, you know, was ousted, I was part of the delegation that from Women's Intercultural Network, we went to Afghanistan and CEDA was approved uh, by Afghanistan. And I even did a workshop in Farsi for women's organization in Afghanistan uh, um, at the time. but. Uh, but definitely countries in conflict zones can benefit a lot if we hold the people in position of power for CEDA eradication that their country uh, has done. And right now um, there are conversations um, at, the, uh, at the UN level with, uh, with even holding Taliban accountable, which I know they're not coming through with those commitments, but really, holding them accountable that um, Afghanistan signed CEDA, ratified CEDA, and we saw uh, the progress in that. Same as Ukraine. Ukraine has signed CEDA, 
and there are committees right now, uh, an organization, women organization in Ukraine that uh, they are holding these issues up uh, because really the core of SIDA is discrimination, anti-discrimination, and it's reflected in the name. And also the many aspects of violence against women perpetuated by war, perpetuated by governments. And uh, so uh, there is a lot we can really reflect on um, how SIDA can be used to protect the, um, the human rights of women and girls. And what using Afghanistan as, as a, a perfect example, what does it mean of what value to be sort of the, the darker side of this um, to hold, let's say, to hold the Taliban accountable? What, what does that mean? And particularly an example like Afghanistan, where you have a more normalized government, whether they were good or bad, that's everybody's you know, independent opinion, whether it was, um, you know, Hani or Taliban. So whoever signs it for that government, theoretically, even if Taliban is in power now, the government, which would be the Taliban, is supposed to honor that. Can they choose to step out of it and say, we, we want out, we don't agree with this? And if not, what does it mean to hold them accountable? Right. Um, I don't know really the legal commitments of the government if they want a way out, but I know that for a fact in the case of Afghanistan, because I follow that closely, I know that it's one of the issues on the table. You know, when, when a government signs something and, uh, the, they, uh, and their, signature, their signature reflects that they're committed to do to do the, to re respect that, then it is on the table, and of, of course, a woman's rights and um, dignity always is on the table, and they negotiate with it. But this is something on the table. I know with mm -hmm. uh, with various um, negotiations, and I hope that um, the global community, countries in North America, Europe hold Taliban accountable and use it as a pressure point for Taliban uh, with all the atrocities that happening to women and girls in Taliban. Right. One question that is along the same lines that I've been asking is, you know, what, what enforcement mechanisms exist? Well, I know that uh, prior to the recent takeover of um, Taliban, Afghanistan by Taliban, SIDA was implemented in many respects. Uh, believe it or not, uh, we had 300 women judges mm -hmm. that now their safety are endangered because Taliban is in power. We had a, 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 a considerable number of women attorneys uh, the, we had Violence Against Women Act in Afghanistan, and we had women participating in the public life as police officer, as teachers, as leader of public private sectors. So these are all the issues that, um, that it's on the table and uh, the global community are pressuring Taliban because of that. Um, so we have to see how it, um, how it end up, but Definitely, the countries that they ratify SIDA uh, or other um, other conventions of human rights, that um, that gives a tool to the people, to the grassroots organization, to NGOs, to civil societies, to hold the government accountable for their commitments. So there, there's not really legally, you know, there's not a part of the document. There's not clear um, enforcement identified, like this is what you need to do. And if you don't do it, this these specific steps will follow. That's not in the not, language not, right now. That's not my understanding, but I know that all the states that signed and ratified SIDA, they are being reviewed. It's the same Human Rights um, Convention of Human Rights and other, uh, they have an expert a body that review this country and probably they're gonna issue the report and um, uh, and give them a bad grade in not uh, not uh, delivering what they committed to. 
Okay, thank you. I didn't mean to beat that to death, but it's it's sort of important the degree to which you know we say things, and then if you can't really enforce it, sometimes the worst perpetrators. That's you know the worst things happen under that environment. Um, but we can move on to some other questions. So, um, how does CEDA define women and girls? Meaning, does the convention include any inclusive language, such as quote and all those identifying as female, end quote. Mm -hmm. If not, is this something that needs to be added? Definitely, I, I foresee that um, uh, CEDA committee is part of UN and they issue a um, general recommendation. The last general recommendation of CEDA committee uh, was on violence against women, specifically violence against women and all aspect of violence against women perpetrated by government, domestic violence in community. And so the language of CEDA or all the international um, uh, conventions, um, it's all subject to development. So we definitely, the language of CEDA is not inclusive of, um, of um, of LGBTQ community or other non-binary and others. So definitely, I think that's something that uh, global community will consider and the experts will develop a general recommendation. But to the best of my knowledge and recollection, that has not happened. This is a, a question locally because uh, uh, the county draft uh, ordinance has delineated all the different possibilities. And there are groups uh, who spoke during the public forum who are opposed uh, about uh, uh, deviating from the original concept that 43 years ago, we're talking about discrimination against women and girls. And uh, so there are those who want to hold to that original convention, uh, but then many others who are advocating to bring it up to date and recognize uh, all the, the distinctions that we have now. Fascinating, because yes, it makes it more complicated. Um, not sure you somewhat answered this, but. Why is the U.S. resisting to ratify CEDAW? What's the major rationale? Rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the U.S. has a problem uh, being a, a part of the world community to the extent of being a subject to uh, international laws. Uh, we uh, have the distinction of being the very only country that has never ratified the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The United States is the sole country. Um, another example, uh, Bob Dole, uh, a, a fine leader of the Senate at one point, a presidential candidate in his wheelchair, he rolled himself down to the wheel of the Senate and pleaded with his colleagues to please ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Disabled. Oh, nothing doing. There's no way to get 67 votes. We have a hard enough time now 50, to get 51 votes, but 67 uh, to be a uh, party to international law and lose our sovereignty, uh, it's just not something the, you know, the US does. Okay, discouraging, but okay. Um, I think you just answered that. Um, this, uh, there's this question and then I sort of have a related question. Does, does CEDA, does this bind all members of the United Nations or does each country have to ratify it? Each country has to ratify it. And of all the countries um, member of uh, United Nations, I have to share that only few have not ratified CEDA. And as an Iranian American, uh, I'm sorry to say that Iran, United States, 
Paula, Somalia, Sudan, and Tonga are the only countries that other than um, Iran and United States, which are rather big countries, uh, some of them are islands that if you pass by plane over those islands, you can't even see them. So they are such a small country. So I'm sorry that the United States in global scene is standing next to Iran, uh, which does not, the government doesn't respect, or respect uh, human rights, women's rights, uh, democracy, or uh, so. So that, yeah, these are the only few countries that have not ratified CEDA. Now this might be a controversial question. And if it is, again, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but um, if the United Nation, if this is a United Nation convention, does, doesn't that mean that the United Nations has to adhere to those tenants? Maybe further question if I'm looking one face is like, what is she asking? So, so for example, um, there have been examples in the war zones and specifically in some of the refugee camps where United Nations officers themselves have significantly abused women and children. So how does that fit with CEDA and who's back sort of a little bit back to that question of, you know, who's managing the store and who who's the enforcer? Absolutely, good question. And I'm very familiar with the context of it because um, uh, actually I, I believe it was three years ago at UN uh, that peacekeeping force had some um, challenges with um, sexual assault of some of the women that in countries they were going to gather water for cooking and cleaning. And there were some cases that made it to media too. So I recall clearly, I believe it was three or four years ago that there were some conversation at UN exactly on the same issue that we need to hold United Nation uh, and the various commissions of United Nation. Of course, we have, um, uh, commission on the status of women, but there are a whole host of other other commissions that we need to hold United Nations accountable for gender parity, like the city of LA in the commissions for uh, for representation of women uh, in those commissions. So this is uh, really a conversation currently happening, and um, and also regarding the election of general. Um, General Assembly, chair of the different commission, different positions, high level position at UN. This conversation is happening. And um, yes, the, um, the NGOs are holding United Nations accountable. Something related to this is that was discussed at this year, Commission on the Status of Women. And I, I know Rosemary and Gail, I know them, they were participating. It's the role of civil society. In, in United Nation and the, the voice of civil society. So this year we saw a little bit uh, improvement in that, that a, a number of civil society representatives were, were allowed to participate in the, in the uh, final document that commission prepared. So these are all really very current, very, um, uh, right on the table for global community and there are conversations happening. Okay, you have, um, Nadia has said, first of all, thanks to both of you for this program. And Alahi, she says, I wanted to ask about two components of CEDA you emphasized as central. Number one is funding. Number two is analysis. Should CEDA ordinances call for a specific provision of funding and amount and in your experience, what qualities make for a strong intersectional gender analysis? Are there particular indicators that you have found that tell us a lot about the status of women and girls in a community? Um, I think all of us can respond to from our perspective to the to the question because uh, we currently um, in city of Long Beach also we passed a resolution 
and uh, we are reconvening the Commission on Studies of Women in Long Beach, which was existed many years ago. So these are very essential question. I think in any ordinance, definitely there is a budget attached to it. Uh, that's clear. But uh, the two component of gender analysis of the city, because each city has its own, as you mentioned at the beginning, each city has, um, has their own um, uh, profile in terms of uh, diversity, in terms of uh, the various aspect of um, the characteristic of a city. So, uh, so definitely gender analysis is really a key part of any effective implementation of CEDA at city or county. The other one is oversight. Uh, because oversight has to be an independent oversight by, by the body that, um, you know, our expert NGOs, women organization, uh, scholars, or however a body can shape. But definitely, uh, I think the quality of um, the oversight body is very critical in successful implementation, their independence from, uh, from the city, city council and city constituency and, and gender analysis are very, sometimes um, cities hire uh, uh, experts for gender analysis. Sometimes it's being delegated to the local university uh, to, for gender analysis. I would invite J Gail and Rosemary to, to add, I know Gail has a lot of experience in, in this regard. Uh, well, I think just because funding always comes up and is a, a central uh, item in this discussion, I would say that uh, that's a very variable topic. In many cities across the country, um, there has been virtually no funding. In some cities, the, uh, the government entity, whether it's the county or the city, uh, funds it itself. In many other in, in other cities, it's a uh, a university funds the research, for example, as a contribution, and the um, the commission or the gender equity task force uh, raises funds separately, and uses that for the gender analysis and the implementation staffing that is needed. So it's each city has to design it as it as it. Um, as it as it's appropriate for that city. In many cases, if you have the support of city county officials, they can find some funding for um, that's necessary for staffing because it has to be coordinated. Um, but it's not very. It does. It can be a half time person, etc. It can be a full time uh, department. It depends on what the city wants to do. And and in many cases. Um, uh, cities have and counties have done it with very little funding. So it really is a variable and it's un, it, therefore it's, um, it's hard to determine what is required. We used to say that a city's for C, a CEDAW initiative in a given city or county requires at least 10 cents to 25 cents per woman in the population. We don't say that anymore because it's not working that way. You know, that comes to some, um, let's say you have uh, uh, 100,000 women. So what would that be in terms of a, a budget? Um, you have to say in some cities that's quite appropriate in many others that's infeasible. So, um, so as you're working through your process, you talk about the funding, the financial uh, entities within a city or county can work with you and determine what's available. And if not, uh, we have found that universities and coalitions, women's foundations, commissions on the status of women and others have raised the funding necessary for the gender analysis and for the implementation um, and the staffing that's required. Yeah. As a former inter international development person um, who focused, which focused on a lot of women's initiatives for, for decades. We, when we started out a long time ago, we were always having, you know, a woman's project or a women and girls project. And over time, we realized in the international development sphere that labeling initiatives like that often caused more problems than if we hadn't. And that sometimes that caused 
more of a gender separation, which arguably we could say if we look at the participants tonight as any indicator in San Diego, what percentage here are men versus women? So what role do men play? Can they play? Should they play? Are they playing? One is that's a, an international kind of question. Number two, it might be different kinds of countries and, you know, and gender issues. And then very interestingly and specifically for us, what about San Diego? Are we a 50-50 community? Do we have 50% men that are also in these discussions and engagement? Supportive, not so supportive? I can respond to the, uh, to the global aspect of it that in many countries, particularly in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, uh, men have been involved in gender equality project. And if, um, if uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, United Nations Commission on the Status of Women had a huge campaign, which uh, many uh, many Iranian NGO, many Iranian American NGO, and also American uh, women organization uh, participated. It was he for she. This was a campaign, meaning that the men that should stand for uh, for gender equality, and because gender equality. Uh, it's not only benefiting women, it's benefiting and empowering the whole community and society. Um, so, um, so yes, that's, um, I can see particularly outside United States and in the Africa, Asia and Latin America that uh, progressive minded men are, um, are more engaged on gender equality efforts of NGOs. And uh, but on San Diego, I think I have to, I have to pass that to Rosemary to respond to it. How about somebody like Anne <laughs> or Olivia, or Olivia Puentes Reynolds, who for years was the activist on the County Commission on the Status of Women. Remember Olivia when we used to have the annual meetings and. Uh, gathered dozens of organizations from around the county. Uh, I don't think we really were taking men into account then. We had lot, we had women veterans. Um, but what? How about some of? Uh, how? What? What have you got to say about this? Because from the point of view of the county commission on the status of women, for example. Well, uh, I would personally, I would support that, what you're talking about. But when we were doing those, um, gathering the women together, at that point in time, there wasn't that many uh, environments where all women were invited to be at the table. So those that was a, like a first that I'd ever seen, where the poorest, the poor, anybody that were new to the United States in San Diego, uh, county came together and were listened to. Like one of the ladies said, usually we're here and we sell things, and but nobody includes us at the table or asks our opinion. So that was the first step, I think, for us. And then we also had uh, different people from different backgrounds uh, participate that even in a, 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 a more inclusive I experience, we did went further and uh, I'm just going to say one of the, we had uh, prayers uh, by the indigenous people in, uh, in San Diego uh, to open the event. Um, so that was the focus there. Um, but I think that um, if you're looking for an opinion, I would say that we still don't have enough voices from all the varied uh, people, uh, women, in San Diego. And I would look to have that happen first mm -hmm. and be in a solid form. And then the other thing is that because most, my, my experiences have been that, that uh, most men don't know how not to participate and kind of overtake things. And no offense to anyone here, but uh, that's been my experience. And um, 
but I think that it's a, something that we should, I would like to see us work towards because it's important for that to happen. But for me to say, oh, I'm going to help this man, you know, when there's lots of women that still have not found their voice yet. And I think you can see that in any of the, mm, most of the places where we're having meetings, they're not women. We're still working on an, the having the different segments of the community uh, represented at the table. And there's lots of history behind all of that. Um, so that's that's my comment on it. Okay. I, I don't see it as mutually exclusive. I, I hear what you're saying. And there's absolutely a time, a place, and a space for women only to have those voices and share and not have to compete with others. But, but I also think that in the long run, if you're going to be successful, if one is going to be successful, the men still control a lot of the community anyway. And so the changes that we want, we have to have the men on board. And so if they're not in that conversation somewhere in the beginning, I think it's hard to bring them in later when you're way down the line in the thinking, missing that opportunity to sort of bring them on board and have some of the ideas germinate from them as well so that they buy in. Just, just an observation. So um, to answer to, to so comment on that is, I think that it'd be very important for there to be rule, not rules, but agreements that uh, if you're gonna be at a table, that if everybody has an opportunity to speak in equal time, that sort of thing, uh, because, uh, uh, or unless they are one of those men that are very special. And that's what I would say. They're very special and thankful. Think, I'm thankful that they're, they're alive. <laughs> and <laughs> so that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's get a little bit more global again. So we've got a few questions. Tell us about the situation in India, obviously, vis-a-vis -vis CEDAW. Well, India has uh, ratified CEDA, and there are many, uh, there are a lot of good work is happening, lots of um, uh, locally and nationally in India. However, India as a country is facing many, many challenges in terms of child marriages, um, uh, domestic violence, and other aspects, same as other countries. But I know that um, to the extent that I am. Um, I have, you know, learned that um, uh, that women's NGO uh, in India are very active, uh, uh, vibrant in demanding um, uh, what women wants and holding the government um, accountable for it. Uh, and I would add that in uh, in India, one of the principal achievements of the CEDA uh, signing that they did some years back is the improved training of lawyers and judges. Mm -hmm. And as they are better educated and trained in the realities of women's condition, uh, you see different uh, rulings now in rape cases and in gender violence uh, issues that affect communities. So that's one improvement that they can point to and say it is about um, not just one thing, but the earlier training then leads to improved uh, functioning of a legal system. So that's an example that's happening in India that I know about. And what about the extreme urban rural divide in countries like in India? How does that play into the CEDAW um, convention protecting everybody? Do they protect everybody equally, equal access for everybody or not? Where does literacy play a role? Uh, definitely those things. I recall at the Beijing Women Conference, um, a whole train of women, uh, inclusive of even some women from the, uh, the countryside came to Beijing and they were engaged in the conversation. Yes, there is a divide uh, in India between urban area and rural area. But women in India are very empowered, and there are many uh, a very rich uh, literature um, uh, about um, you know empowerment of even women in in countryside. 
definitely um, the divide between rural and urban area in India is, uh, is not being closed. Actually, it's widening based on uh, the information that um, we are hearing, but, uh, but definitely um, lots, of, um, lots of women empowerment is happening also in countryside. I was in Bangalore for a woman peace conference. Uh, some of the conversation that uh, was happening there was also um, in the context of uh, foreign uh, investment in India and uh, particularly technology in Bangalore. Uh, they call it Silicon Valley of yeah. India, of Bangalore. And, um, and the, the woman that they were working in those uh, industries and protecting their rights and everything. And the CEDA was coming to, uh, to the referencing and using CEDA for protection of the um, the pay equity and other things for women in India. And our last question, which is along similar lines and somewhat big in scope, what about China and what about Russia? Well, I know that they both both uh, both countries have ratified CEDA. The, that's definitely is for sure. But regarding of how well uh, the articles of CEDA are being, have been implemented in both countries. I'm not very knowledgeable on that, but I know that both countries have ratified CEDA. Related to that, what about the reporting out? That's a good point. So is there, I should have read and I didn't, um, is there like an annual report that each country sends into the United Nations, I assume? And uh, I also assume that, that that um, open information, I mean, so it would be accessible if we want, if we were interested in the details for Russia, China, India, and other countries, the United Nations would have those annual reports. Uh, sure. My understanding is, and uh, Gail, correct me if I'm wrong, um, my understanding is uh, that it's every two years and the CEDA committee. Um, look into each state parties and they have to provide a re report. And so there is a like um, periodic, periodic review that uh, for human rights declaration, each country is being reviewed. Um, so there is periodic review for, for CEDA committee. And yes, those are public information and it's at the site of CEDA committee part of um, UN uh, website. I, I think I got all of the questions. Um, one last question. I'm not positive if we covered it. Can the world court, I don't know if they mean ICC, mm -hmm. can the world court consider non-compliance with CEDA? Uh, this has been talked about, but that is not a feature of the CEDAW convention at this time. Uh, and, and don't forget that you have to be a signatory to, to the, the World Court, the International Criminal yeah. Court and all of that for it to be relevant to a given case. So that's a little more complex. And so, you know, CEDAW, we believe that CEDAW will address the issues of women and girls around the world and locally, but it, it isn't a panacea for every every issue that affects the human condition, you know. So, uh, the World Court can be a, a feature of um, of activity in the uh, at, among United Nations member states, but it isn't the only feature. So, okay, um, I'm going to thank you, and as I thank you, I'm going to do a share screen so you can see our next upcoming event. Oops, because I don't know how that. Works. To go to that. Go to that. But first of all, I want to thank um, Alahi and Rosemary for a really interesting discussion. And I'm glad we've recorded it because I hope that many more people will take the opportunity to listen to this because it's, it's fascinating both internationally and, of course, um, now that we're dealing with it very specifically in San Diego, I think there's a lot of information that most of us should know. We should know the data, understand the analysis, 
be really clear what the issues are and if there are um, sticking points, then I think we should have those discussions and help move it forward, unstick them and help move it forward. So thank you both, not just for the presentation, but the larger role that you're playing, that you have played and you're continuing to play, as well as some of your key colleagues who were speaking today, Olivia and Gail and Anne and others if I missed them. But thank you all so much for that. And maybe we'll have to have you come back. So when will we know, um, when is it likely an ordinance will be approved? We're waiting to hear whether they're going forward with the original schedule, which was April 26. There was a problem because when there are changes made in a draft, all the different departments have to sign off. So it's a quite a lengthy review process. So the chances are that um, maybe April 26 will not be the date. But um, you know, soon after that, certainly this year. Okay, so by the so maybe by the end of the year it would be it would be interesting to share what actually went through and and where are we and where are we going and then sort of track it. That would be fascinating to know that. So again, thank you both for all your preparation and thank your colleagues for the all the work that you've done that's so important internationally as well as locally, California as well as San Diego. Um, and Please take a look that on Tuesday, May 17th, we're going to have Professor Goria from um, uh, University of San Diego speak to us on social justice. She's gonna give examples from around the world. And if you are not a member or if your membership is ending, please consider either rejoining, renewing or joining. And also please encourage your friends. We're hoping to um, transition, not, not black to white, but we are hoping to, to start maybe hybrid um, events, having some more in-person events and hybrid events of what we do have. And always we want to thank our sponsors who are so generous and kind and allow us to be able to continue doing what we do. So um, we don't have to take the time here, but when you uh, hang up or click off tonight, Take a few minutes maybe and think of the people in Afghanistan, people in Syria, the people in Ukraine, people in Latin America, you know, all the different places in the world that are really suffering um, and say a prayer for all of them and for peace and strength to the women. So good night and thank you everybody. <laughs>